Hello, I am back. I'm in a slightly different place this time. I'm sitting at the table today. So I'm here to update you on week two of Socialize. I forgot my manners. How are you? I hope you've had a reasonable week. I, I hope you've had a good week, but I don't know if that's possible in the current lockdown situation. So I hope you've had the best week possible. Thank you for coming back. I'm going to talk to you about eye contact this week because that's what we did for Socialize week two. So we started off with the pros of eye contact and that's that it can help you start or maintain an interaction like you know when someone wants to talk to you if you can look at them. Um, you can also show that you're interested by looking at them and maintaining their gaze and interestingly, I also learned that it can help you gauge someone's emotions, which I suppose is true because mostly we express our emotions with our face. And one of the ladies running the course explained that people can smile with their eyes, which sounds really bizarre because of course you can't smile with your eyes, but you can. So for example, I'm not smiling, I'm smiling. You can see it in my eyes. Um, which is especially useful at the moment because a lot of humans are wearing masks and that makes things additionally difficult. We, we spoke about that as well, that masks and sunglasses can make it really hard to read the visual cues, emotions, signals, all these things just make it additionally complicated. Also, a lot of the time when someone is speaking to me, if it's, for example, on Zoom, I feel more comfortable to be looking directly at them, but I will look at their mouth because somehow that helps me process what they're saying. I think I do an element of lip reading that I'm not always consciously aware of. Um, so masks have inhibited that. However, when I meet people face to face, I don't look at their faces. I tend to look at their shoes or their clothing, which did lead to me thinking I was face blind, which means that you have the inability to sort of hold and recognise people's faces. It turns out I just don't look at them, so of course I don't know what they look like next time I see them. Um, I picked that up a lot with my counsellor, where she would change her shoes and and it would, it would just make me stop or she'd have different clothes on and that's additionally difficult when you see somebody in a setting that they shouldn't be in in your brain like you know you sort of box people into categories and suddenly you see somebody like I saw somebody who worked at the hospital but on the university campus and the two don't really go <laughs> so yes I am I am digressing I told you there would be a lot of tangents here but Yes, that's another reason why it's good to look at people's faces so you can recognise them later. There are obviously some cons of eye contact, especially if you're autistic. So for me, it makes my body what I call squirmy, um, and they help me to recognise that means uncomfortable. It, it just makes me feel horrible having to maintain eye contact, especially with strangers. It gets a bit easier if I know the person. Um, additional cons that we've sort of touched upon are that it can make it harder to process. So if you're looking at someone's face and your brain is going, okay, maintain eye contact, am I looking in the right place on their face? Why are they blinking so many times? You're not actually listening to what they're saying, so you're not necessarily taking in the conversation. And again, it can mean that you're not concentrating or you lose concentration. So for some people, like myself, if I look at your shoes, I'm actually going to be taking more in and processing more and potentially be more interested in what you're saying. But that goes against sort of social norms and what people expect. We also learned something really interesting, which I found particularly useful. Um, autistic people or people generally who struggle with eye contact tend to be people who also struggle with visual stimuli like 
overstimulation in terms of lights, uh, bright lights, flashing lights, all those things. Um, they seem to be linked, which I thought was really interesting because yes, I do struggle with bright lights, um, screens, things like that. So it was interesting to see that they go together. Um, we spoke about how much is too much and what is not enough. And it was interesting that, I'm saying interesting a lot, sorry, I, I did genuinely find it already interesting, that too much eye contact can be seen as intimidating or aggressive, especially, now I don't like to go down these gender stereotypes, but especially with males, um, potentially from the animal kingdom, because lions like, oh, you're looking at me, oh, you're looking at me, you're not blinking, I'm not going to blink first, I'm going to eat you. I don't know if it goes quite like that, but that's how it goes in my head at least. Um, so yes, it can make people cross or angry or become sort of aggressive, I suppose. Um, but it can also make people really worried or paranoid. So if you're staring at somebody, they're obviously going to be like, why are you looking at me? What's wrong with me? Have I got something on my face? Have I done something wrong? When sometimes for me, it's just that I really like something about them, like I really like their top, or I really like their shoes, or maybe they have a dog and I'm just staring at their dog. It takes me a very long time to decide whether or not I can tell that person, and if it's appropriate. So I do tend to stare, and sometimes I'm not even aware that I'm doing it, and I'm potentially not even actually looking at the person, I've just drifted off in my head. But yes, we spoke about that. Um... As well as when you're not making eye contact enough, people then think you're not listening or you're not interested. Or again, it's about emotions quite a lot of the time and how they feel and how you feel. And oh, it's stressful. Um, we looked at quick fixes again. So if you stare at somebody for a bit long, sometimes they might actually approach you and tell you. And you can say, oh, I'm really sorry, I didn't realise I was doing that, I zoned out. Or you could just say, actually, I really struggle with eye contact. If you're not making that eye contact, about disclosure again. Um, and one of the ladies running the group actually said that she'd met someone who did that at the beginning. Um, he said to her, sorry, I really struggle with eye contact, so I might not make much. And then after that, he actually made more eye contact from having disclosed because that anxiety is gone. So that was quite a nice story. Um, a positive for the people if you make eye contact is that they feel heard and you've then got their emotions and visual clues again. So you can tell if someone's upset or if someone's cross when you look at them. It's a bit easier. Um, and again, you can recognise them if you meet them. So we learned that if eye contact is uncomfortable, you can look at someone's ear, or their forehead, or their nose, or their chin, and they won't know. They'll think you're looking at their eyes. Um, and it might even be more helpful to be looking at their mouth, so you can be processing what they're saying as well. We learned about the three second rule, so tend to make eye contact for three seconds roughly, but try not to count that in your head, because if you do, then again, you're not listening, you're not processing. So I think it's going to be a sort of trial and error, and gradually you'll get that sort of intuition of how long the three minutes is. Um, and in the meantime, we can also practice active listening. So nodding, smiling, going, mm-hmm, mm, -hmm, mm and that's really interesting, or maybe paraphrasing what the person has said, also making sure your body is angled towards them, your feet are facing them. If there's more than one person in the conversation, you tend to go to the person who's talking. If there's two people, it's going to be a bit like ping pong, but apparently that's okay, that's normal. <laughs> um, I also asked the question, do blind people make eye contact? And the conclusion was that Although not eye contact, they do have the act of listening because they can't see, they rely on their hearing, so they would move their body to where the sound is coming from. Although that did make me think this morning, well then do deaf people make eye contact? And this is the problem with my brain. You get one question, you get one answer, seven more questions. So yeah, I'm working on that. 
Um, we also once again looked at checking questions. So, are you okay? Are you listening? Or have you got time to talk to me? Are you busy? It's the always when you're feeling like something's not right or you're not understanding, it's about checking and that's okay because we all need some support sometimes. We all need to seek reassurance, even neurotypical people. And then finally, again with the quick fixes, if someone's getting annoyed because you're not making eye contact and you don't feel comfortable saying, I struggle with eye contact, you can just say, I, I wasn't ignoring you, um, I was thinking or I was processing or, yeah, there's, there's always a quick fix. If things go wrong, you've got your checking questions and it's just about being honest and seeing how it is for you because eye contact might take time and for some people it's about practicing in the mirror, looking at themselves and working out where they can look on somebody's face, looking just over their shoulder. It's about finding out what works for you, but ultimately, if it does make you uncomfortable, you don't have to. Like, just be you. Don't conform to social norms or neurotypical stereotypes if they're going to make your life more difficult. You're absolutely fine as you are, but if you would like to change things slightly, then Go for it. Go ahead. See if these will work for you. They might not work for everybody, but if you keep trying, then it might just get easier. Once again, 100% recommend Socialize. I'm really enjoying it. Um, still mostly using the chat box function on Zoom because, yeah, it can be hard to find your words sometimes. And But otherwise, it's been nice meeting some new people, especially when they have common experiences and understand you that's been one of the best things like I think the autism team that I'm under and that I engage with are potentially the best NHS team I have ever seen and I've been in services for about 10 years now and they they just get it and I haven't really experienced that. So yeah, anything that you're offered by your autism team, just just try it because I was really nervous about socialise and I didn't know whether it would be for me, especially not online, but it's actually been great. And it's given me a space that I didn't know I needed, but now it's, it's just been amazing. Thank you.